please help me welcome my friend, Nate Bagley. He's totally making fun of me right now. So No, I'm not making fun of you. That was a, that was a great intro, though. Thank you. I'm so happy to be on your podcast. Oh, good. And Come you on. know what? I'm even more happy to be considered a friend of yours. Yes, for sure. Yeah. For sure. Well, I know all about you, but let's start by telling the audience a little bit about yourself and your family. Okay. Um, my name's Nate. I grew up in Salt Lake City. Uh, I... I'm married to an amazing woman named Angeline. She is one of the most compassionate and kind and thoughtful and just sweet people you will ever meet. And she's hilarious. Um, and how and in the heck did she fall for you? I don't know. I don't know <laughs> what I did. Honestly, I like, I, I'll be generous with myself and say like on, in the looks department, I'm a solid like seven, seven and a half. She's a straight 10. <laughs> <laughs> on a bad day, like a 9.5. And she had her pick of whoever she wanted. And for some reason, she picked me. And I feel really, really grateful that she did. Um, the, actually, can I tell you a story? Something that happened this week? You bet. Um, we, we went for a walk. Um, there's a park near our house that has this lake. And we decided, like, the fall weather has been really nice this week. It's been, like, 60 degrees here in Salt Lake. And um, so we went to go take a nice little walk around the lake and watch the sunset. And we got halfway around the lake and my wife just stops and she looks at me and she goes, I just gotta tell you, every single day that we're married, I love you more and more. And I didn't know marriage could be this good. And I just feel so lucky to be married to you. And I was just like, what? <laughs> You're so cool. Like, it just Aww. like, it's little moments of light like that that make me just so grateful to be married to a woman who sees that a very imperfect guy like me, who is not naturally gifted at relationships, is trying his best and she gives me credit. It means a lot. Oh, I love that. And I love her. Okay. So now you guys haven't been married for that long in the grand scheme of things, nope. but you have been in the marriage space for a really long time. So tell us yeah. how you got interested in marriage even before you were married. Hey, thanks for setting me up to tell my story. Um, I... When I was, I was always raised in a, I was raised in a family where growing up and getting married was kind of the expectation. And really early on in my life, I noticed that there are some couples where like I go to my friend's house and their parents just looked like they were having a fun time being married. They'd laugh together, they'd joke around with each other, they were going on dates, they were flirting with each other. And then I go to other people's houses and I would see, I would like feel tense, tension in the air and their parents would argue in front of us, and it just like kind of gave me the sick pit in my stomach. And I knew that when I grew up one day, I was gonna get married, and I knew that if I got married, I wanted to have the type of relationship that was more like the fun, playful, flirty kind. And when I got into my mid-20s and all my friends started to get married, and even some of my younger siblings started to get married, I started to wonder like, why isn't this working out for me? <laughs> and I realized that my relationships had two things in common. One is that every single one failed, and the other one is that I was a part of it. So <laughs> I figured it was high time I figure out what was what, what I needed to learn so that I could have that type of a relationship. So um, I was this single 20, like 7, 28-year-old guy, and I decided to quit my job and spend the better part of a year traveling around the country interviewing couples who had amazing relationships. And my goal was to figure out what they did that was different than what everybody else was doing that made the relationship so great. And that's kind of how I got my start is I became this anti-expert, this guy who just was on this quest to figure out what made truly extraordinary love possible. And then after doing a lot of those interviews, the opportunity started to open up for me to talk to therapists and researchers and authors and other experts in the space. I got to sit down and talk to Gary Chapman who wrote The Five Love Languages. I've interviewed John and Julie Gottman on several occasions. They're, they're like the godfathers of marriage research. and um, and I, I found myself like find, finding answers on behalf of people who were listening to these interviews on my podcast. So that's kind of how it all started. I became this kind of weird marriage anti-expert before I was even married. Yeah. Well, let's talk about these interviews for a second, because <laughs> you have interviewed some of the greats and I can't figure out how you're doing this, but getting like the most recognized names in marriage resource research to sit down and chat with you and tell you all of their tricks. But 
what are some of the most important things you've learned from them over the years? And you can be specific or general, but what's had the greatest impact in your own life and in your own marriage from all of your conversations with these marriage greats? That's a, that's a great question. Um, I think, I think one of the things that's most important to realize is that your, I don't like the word work, but your marriage requires effort, constant effort. And, and that it's just like, if you want to be really good at baking or really good at a specific sport or really good at a musical instrument, like you can't just learn it and then walk away from it. It has to, it requires constant maintenance in order for you to be in like peak form. And so what I've learned from the majority of these experts and these amazing couples is that they all have a tendency to um, have kind of a growth mindset. They're constantly looking for ways that they can improve and be better. And they don't, they don't settle for mediocrity. And I feel like it's important to clarify, especially in the relationship space, when you hear somebody say, don't settle, often what they're, what they're saying is like, you're so great. Don't settle for somebody who's less great than you. But in this case, it's more like, hey, what am I capable of? And am I settling for less than what I am capable of? Or am I settling for, could I be a better husband or could I be a better wife? And in what ways could I be better? And am I settling in my life right now for who I could be? Does that make sense? Absolutely. No, I love that analogy. It's almost like, it, it's kind of your relating marriage to sports almost. Like, yeah. you know, if you don't practice, you stop developing and then- absolutely you know, you, you're not the best athlete you could possibly be, but there is so much overlap between marriage and business or marriage and sports. Or, um, like I had a friend reach out to me today and he was telling me all the parallels between marriage and poetry. And I was like, wow, it's so interesting. But if there's anything you're passionate about, you can probably relate it to marriage. And I think sports is one of the best analogies you can. Yeah. You can dream definitely up. One that I understand. I love it. So over time, you've kind of become like the communication and marriage guy. Like, yeah. can you talk, and I've, I've, I've heard your analogy and maybe others have too, but can you talk about the analogy you make about how communication and marriage is kind of like doing the dishes? Absolutely. So I became the communication guy by, not by choice. <laughs> um, it's, it's because every person I talk to, if they're struggling in the relationship, I'd say nine times out of 10, they say they're struggling with communication. And um, what, what they, most people actually aren't struggling with communication. What people are struggling with is having difficult conversations. And I think one of the, the biggest contributors to people having a hard time having difficult conversations is because they don't do the dishes every day. So here's the analogy. Um, <laughs> if you have dinner and right when you're done eating, you go over to the sink and you rinse off the dishes and you put them in the dishwasher, the dishes take like, two minutes, maybe, maybe five, if you had a very cooking intense, <laughs> intensive dinner, but it's not that hard if you just rinse stuff off right when you use it and put it in the dishwasher. Yeah. Um, but if you're like me, which <laughs> I do this a lot, you just go, I'll take care of it later. And then the next day rolls around and the dishes pile up and the dishes pile up and the dishes pile up. And then you go to get a drink of water and you realize there's no clean cups and you have to do the dishes. If you're going to have like something to eat on that night. <laughs> and then you turn to this giant pile of dishes and it feels daunting and overwhelming. And you realize that the stuff at the very bottom has had like four days or five days to get all crusty and hard. And you have to like pull out the sand blaster, the pressure washer to get all the gunk off just so the dishwasher will clean them. And it ends up taking like three hours instead of the five minutes that it would have otherwise taken you. That is, that is a perfect analogy for how some people deal with communication. So research shows that the happiest and most fulfilled couples actually have what's called a low negativity threshold. And what that means is that they don't let negativity build up in the relationship. If something happens and somebody's feelings get hurt or somebody uses a tone that is a little um, harsh or, or, or just something bad happens that causes tension between the two partners, the happiest couples clean it up immediately. Just like, that, that dish that you just finished eating off of. Um, they, they take care of the problem and then it doesn't have time to pile up. The most miserable people, the most miserable couples, they tend to um, let the little things go. They let, uh, they let 
they pick their battles, they let little stuff go just roll off their back, you know, which we hear that advice a lot. Pick your battles, um, let the little things go. But that's actually really terrible advice that the most miserable couples let those little things pile up and pile up and pile up until one day the straw that breaks the camel's back comes in and it's like that one last cup that you put on top of the dishes and it's like, I had it, I can't deal with this anymore. And they have these explosive emotional arguments that it's even over something that might be really small, but the emotion has built up over days or weeks or even months. And it just causes this huge mess in the relationship. And so I encourage couples to learn, and it's a skill, to learn to clean up their messes really, really quickly. My wife and I now, um, when something goes bad, the things that used to take us days to work through now take us literally minutes or even sometimes seconds. It's just like a couple of key words that we've figured out. And you know, my wife will say, hey, could you try that again? And I'll be like, oh, I used a tone of voice that was not very nice. So I'll say the thing again, and she goes, thank you. And I go, no problem. And then it's like, no crisis, no crisis, no drama. Um, so, so yeah, that's, that's kind of the dishes analogy is it's, it's important to not let your dishes build up over time or it turns into a daunting task and it can actually cause, it can cause a massive emotional separation and distance between you and your partner over time. Yeah, it's true. I love that analogy so much. Thanks. Okay. So you, t- <laughs> so you talk about this framework that I want to spend the rest of our time talking about. Yeah. And that is, I know you, I like you, and I've got your back. So you talked about this in the summit. I love it. I've gotten so many great feedbacks. Is that a, I've gotten so much great That's, feedback. That'll be the plural of feedback, feedbacks. Okay. Okay. Anyways, uh, lots of people really, really love that framework that you kind of put together. So what are some great ways to get to know your spouse and show them that you're interested in knowing them? Great question. So the premise behind this, I know you, I like you, I have your back thing is this is another conflict issue. A lot of people struggle with conflict in their marriage, not because they aren't good communicators, but because they have stopped investing in their friendship. And in my opinion, the, the very core of your friendship, the foundation, there's like three foundational pillars to a really solid friendship. It's I know you, I'm interested in your life, I'm interested in what you've got going on in your head and in your heart, I'm interested in the people who are important to you and what's stressing you out, what you're proud of. Um, I, li- I, I like you, which is I actually enjoy spending time with you. And then I have your back, which is I trust you. Like, I, and you trust me, we have this mutual relationship where we can depend on each other. And if you think of any friendship that you have, in, in, like especially outside your family, all three of those components are there. I know you, I like you, I've got your back. I know you, I like you, I've got your back. And as soon as one of those things starts to weaken, we stop, to, we stop confiding in each other. Um, if you don't know somebody, uh, but you really like them and you have their back, but you just, you don't know what's going on in their life. It's, it's like that old high school friend that you used to be really close to. And now you think you find yourselves just like pulled apart because of life circumstances. And you might still really love them a lot, but you can't really be friends anymore because you don't even talk. You don't know what's going on in each other's lives. Um, if you have a lack of, I like you, I think the, the best example of the lack of, I like you is um, Buzz Lightyear and Woody in Toy Story, the first one, like they're, they know each other and they have to have each other's back because they have a common goal, but man, they hate each other. (laughs) Um, This is what I would refer to as a marriage of mutual toleration. Like they know who each other is and they're united in like raising their kids together, but they don't kiss anymore. They don't want to go on dates with each other. They tolerate each other's existence and it just does, it's not fun to be around each other. They're not like looking forward to date night. And then the I have your back situation, like if the trust is missing and your partner's constantly breaking their promises or you're breaking your promises to your partner, how can you expect them to to openly communicate with you? And so when one of those things is missing, it makes conflict really, really difficult to navigate because you're constantly wondering, is that person going to be there for me? I don't really like this person, so I don't really want to open up and share things with them. Or I don't know them, so I don't know what their reaction is going to be or what they have going on in their life. And it makes conflict really hard. So I think that if you're having conflict in your marriage, the place to start is with those three pillars. I know you, I like you, and I have your back. Um, so you asked what are some things, sorry, I just like 
No, yeah. that's perfect. I should have asked you to explain it first. Now that we've got a good foundation, yeah. that's how we can build that I know you pillar. Yeah, so the I know you pillar, the best way to build that is to ask your partner open-ended questions. Um, ask, ask your partner questions that are not yes or no questions. When your partner comes home, at, or, or you come home at the end of the day, what's the first question you typically ask? How was your day? How was your day? Yeah. Um, fine. Good. It's all right. You know, how many, how often do we answer with these one word questions? Right. Like if you really want to know your partner, ask them something that requires them to form a thought like, Hey, what was the most stressful thing that went on at work today? Or, Hey, tell, tell me about a victory that you had. Did you have any like little or big wins at, um, while I was gone, while we were apart or, um, Hey, who's yeah, some other, uh, there's a really great app. Um, in the app store that's called the Gottman card decks and they have hundreds and hundreds of open-ended questions that you can just scroll through on your phone but it's any any question that will give you um, give you insight into what's going on in your partner's life it could be anything from tell me who's most important to you in your life right now that's not related to you to um, what's a what's something you've always dreamed of doing but you haven't done because you think it's like selfish or unreasonable you could ask them what's the thing that's most stress stressful in their life right now. Um, you could ask them what's something that I could follow up with you on later in in the day. You know, sometimes we don't even know what's going on in our partner's day, and they might have a big meeting, or they might have like a, a stressful uh, doctor's appointment that's coming up. And if we don't know, we don't we can't follow up with them and be like, hey, how did that thing go? Yeah, we miss we miss the opportunity to be involved in our partner's life. Yeah. So, so I, what I'm hearing you say is the key to I know you is asking really good questions. Yep. Answers. Yep. yep. I like that. What about what are the best ways to show your spouse that you like them? Oof. I love this one. Um, to me, there's, there's two important parts of I like you. It's how you treat your partner. It's treating your partner like you like them, but it's also how you perceive your partner. And some, some, my favorite activity to do is to give very specific and very sincere compliments based on a positive attribute that you know your partner possesses. So something like, um, something that I would say to my wife is like, honey, I love how compassionate you are. Uh, I noticed this week when you were playing with your niece and nephew, when your, when your niece fell down and she got hurt, you were the first one to be there by her side and make sure she was okay. And that just, it's so, I love how compassionate you are. You are such a sweet and kind person. Um, a very specific instance of a quality that exemplifies her character. Not only does that make her feel like a million dollars because she's being caught doing something good, but it also, and this is even more important, it also makes me see my wife through rose colored glasses. Mm -hmm. It makes me think, of her in fond ways if I'm looking to catch her doing good things. Right. And I think it's really tempting in life to catch our partner doing the bad things and try and correct them. I think it's easy to criticize them for their shortcomings, um, to be upset with them for the ways in which they let us down. And it takes extra effort to catch them doing the good things sometimes. Well, it's but, all about what you look for, right? You're gonna absolutely. have evidence for what you're looking for. So if you're looking for all the ways you like them, that's what's gonna stand out to you. Perfect summary, perfect summary. So, so yeah, doing that, doing that is a great way to build, to make your partner like you more because you're noticing things that they want to be noticed and then also it helps you put on those rose colored glasses. Yeah, for sure. And if you're a words of affirmation girl like yours truly, man, I'm, I feel like I'm always asking my husband like, what did you like about me today or this week? Or yeah. like, tell me all the ways that you love me. Not because I don't think that he does. It's just because I love to hear it. Just oh, I love that you do that. <laughs> I, I, some people are like, I shouldn't, I shouldn't have to ask. Like no. I shouldn't have to ask for what, my, what I want my partner. It's so much more romantic if my partner just gives it to me. No. My thought is the most generous gift you can give your partner is setting them up to be successful. So I'm a words of affirmation person too. And I'm constantly like, okay, so I have some friends, Josh and Casey. And um, one of the things they do is, this is brilliant. They will like do a chore. Let's say they, they clean the kitchen. Mm -hmm. And if Casey cleans the kitchen, she'll go, Josh, Josh, 
come ooh and ah for me. Yes. And he'll walk into the kitchen and be like, ooh, the kitchen is so clean. Ah, you even did the dishes. And it's like this playful script that they have to give each other acknowledgement and praise for the ways that they're contributing to the marriage. And yeah. it's like, there's no shame in doing that at all. I love that. I love that yeah. so much. Okay, so now, uh, how can we be sure that our spouse knows that we have their back? Yep, this is an important one. Um, because there are a lot of people out there who are struggling because their partner has broken promises over and over and over again. They're hurting, they feel a sense of betrayal and um, they wonder like, can I ever trust my partner again? And if you're in a situation like that or just in a situation where you're like, I just, I don't think I can leave my husband at home with my kids for more than an hour, you know, or the house is gonna get torn apart and somebody might die. (laughs) <laughs> or I don't think I can give my wife a credit card where she's going to just like overspend on the budget and we're going to find ourselves in debt and all the work that I've done is going to just be for nothing. You know, there's all these, there's these trust issues that we have. I'm not going to let my wife go hang out with her girlfriends because I don't know if she's going to go out and get herself into trouble and then who knows what will happen. You know, we hear all these horror stories and then we, we live in such a way that, that doesn't allow us to accept our partner for exactly who they are. And um, so I think if you're in a position where you need to gain your partner's trust, the best thing you can do is start to make and keep promises on the regular, promises that you know you can keep. And, oh, go ahead. Well, I was gonna say, what about like having your back, like my sister-in-law keeps talking trash about me, like, do you have my back? Like those types of. Yes, so that's another great thing. Um, So making sure that you put your partner first, there's a, I love the Gottman's talk a lot about having an us versus the world mentality, yeah, how that. you should always take your partner's side first, even if you don't agree with them, just because you should be, you should be making decisions for two. You have to realize that like when you're, when you're married, if you want to have a, an amazing marriage, you have to take into consideration how your choices are going to affect your partner, not only um, but in, in every aspect, mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually socially you know there's moments where i as the social butterfly i need to be like you know what guys can't come to the party tonight wife's an introvert she spent the last 13 hours working in a hospital taking care of people she's not going to have gas and she's going to she's probably going to want some recharge time with me so i need to pass on the thing that i want because i'm making decisions for two if if i was making making it for myself i'd be out there um if if my if my mom says something critical of which she never would because she's so sweet. Um, But if she ever did say something critical of my wife, I, I would step in and be like, "Mm, not okay with me. Yeah. Um, So that's, that's important as well. I think just take into consideration, are you making decisions for two? Do you have a you versus the world mentality? Are you making and keeping your promises? And are you allowing your partner a little bit of room to be imperfect? Um, This is the benefit of the doubt. Yeah, and just and also just like, um, I, I feel like, so I was talking to my really good friend, Laura Heck, who's a marriage and family therapist, and she says, she talks, we talk a lot about how 69% of conflict in marriage is unresolvable conflict, meaning it's the type of conflict, it's just the, you have the same conflict over and over and over again in different ways. And it typically comes from the fact that like you're two very different people that have been raised in two very different families. And like, if I'm a neat freak and my, my wife is cluttery or if I'm always on time and she's always late or um, you know, if if that type, if I'm an early bird and she's like a night owl, those are fundamental differences that are always just going to talk, cause a little bit of tension in our relationship. And there's so many people who come into her office and they'll say, look, Laura, we, um, I would love to have a better marriage. And the thing that needs to happen is my husband or my wife needs to change this, this, and this. And they're all innate qualities that are really not changeable. Like I can't just tell my wife, I can't, our marriage would be better if you were just an early riser and you need to either figure that out or we're, or we're not going to have a happy marriage because she's just not, she's a night owl. It's not something you can change. So what, what she says she hears when people come into her office and say something like that is I would really love my partner if they were someone different. (laughs) <laughs> yeah do you know what I mean I sh- I, our partner would be amazing or our marriage would be amazing if my partner was not who they were yeah and I think part of trust is allowing your partner 
to do things differently than the way you would do them, to live a little bit differently than you would, you would live, and to just like allow your partner a little bit of grace to make some mistakes and not be the ideal version of what you perceive to be a, a partner. Yeah. And um, accept your partner for who they are. And when they feel accepted, they'll actually show up and, and impress you quite a bit, I think. Yeah, I like to say, knock it off. Like your spouse's only job is to be them. Yeah. Your job is to figure out how to love them exactly the way they are. Stop trying to change them, knock it off. And you're so good at it. Yeah. I like, no, you are. I, I got to spend a couple of days with you and your family up in Boise. And, or as the people from Boise call it, Boise. <laughs> no. Yeah, it happens. I hear it all the time. <laughs> But, um, but I got to spend time in your home and I just saw how, not only how welcoming your family was to me, this like weird guy just staying at your house, but how, how you gave permission to every single person in your family to be exactly who they are. And each one of your kids and your husband has different strengths and different weaknesses. And you are so good at just like embracing them for exactly the phase of life that they're in, the personality that they have cultivated the unique talents that they each have and like that's a it's a really cool it was really cool to see oh well thank you I appreciate yeah. that compliment but I was also thinking when you were talking about that the have your back part the creating that us against the world mentality it also applies to your children like us against the kids because you run into a lot of problems when you start siding with the children against your spouse that's definitely a time no no definitely your kids are part of that world that you are sometimes against totally totally and i'm even like i even tell my kids i'm like hey listen if you guys want to talk about how crappy your parents are like if you guys want to be upstairs and band together and talk about how your parents are so mean and they're ruining your life hey, that is totally fine with me like i'm glad you have someone to commiserate with because we stand united and so right. you guys can all talk about it nothing's going to change but you know. You're welcome to go find new parents if you want. Exactly. I think they can do a better job. Exactly. I also told my kids this week that you have the coolest stinking mom on the planet, but do not betray my trust. <laughs> <laughs> then you're in big trouble. But yeah. if you are honest with me, dang, I'm really cool. I promise you that. I love it. Yeah. Okay. So I love this. So going from studying and teaching about marriage to actually being married, what has been the most fun thing about implementing all of this research and all of these things that you're learning with this, with your beautiful wife? The most fun thing is seeing that when you do the work, when you, so I'm going to preface this because I preface everything. <laughs> um, Knowing what to do and actually doing it are two very different things. Mm -hmm. And I like to call, I, I am inherently an insight chaser. I love reading a really good book or listening to an amazing podcast. I love taking a workshop or going through a training and, and learning something new. It's like super stimulating. It gets my brain cooking. I get the, the rush of the endorphins and the positive chemicals, the oxytocin and um, it feels really good, but it doesn't change my life unless I am an action taker. So you have to transition from insight chaser to action taker. And the coolest thing about marriage for me has been taking all of this years of knowledge that I've been gathering doing these interviews and workshops and trainings and reading books and stuff like that and putting it into practice and seeing how it actually works inside this specific relationship, this unique microcosm, this environment that my wife and I create together. And um, like I did an experiment in the first year of marriage where every single day uh, of the week I did something, like I, was, I just tried to figure out, okay, what's my wife's love language? So I, um, I like made dinner for her and I bought her flowers and I cleaned the house and then um, whenever she comes home from work as a nurse, I would, when she'd come home, I'd do the golden retriever thing and I'd be super excited to see her. I'd run and greet her at the door and then I would pin her up against the wall and give her this like long 10 second kiss. And at the end of the week, I was like, hey, what did you notice this week? What did I do well? And she's like, oh my gosh, that kiss. <laughs> oh, it was so, I can't like having that passionate kiss every single day was so amazing. I don't know where that came from, but I loved it. And I was like, did you notice the flowers I got you? And she's like, you got me flowers? <laughs> I was like, yeah, they've been on the table for like three days. 
And she's like, no, no, they haven't. And we ran into the kitchen and she's like, Nate, I'm so sorry. I totally missed them for three days. Thank you so much I'm for getting me these flowers. But I realized like my wife doesn't care that much about flowers. What she cares about is being wanted and cuddled and kissed and held. And that makes her feel amazing. And so um, inside my marriage, I got to run this experiment and realize like I'm a student of my partner. I'm a student of my wife and I can figure out what are the things that cheer her up when she's sad? What are the things that make her really happy? What are the things that motivate her to be an amazing wife? Um, and I'm, I'm like becoming, I don't, it's, it's so exciting to see how I can change how I show up to influence how she shows up. And then together we can create this amazing, fun relationship that creates the type of connection that I talked about at the beginning of this podcast, where we're going for a walk around the lake and my wife goes every single day, I'm more in love with you. That's totally what I was thinking when you said that too. Yeah. Yeah. It's really, it's so much fun when you get into that, that, that dynamic. Okay. So. I love that so much. And I'm going to issue a challenge to all of my listeners, whether you have been married for three days or you've been married for 30 years, I think you should do one week of just intensive experimentation on what your spouse's love language is and see what they notice. Yes. Without asking them. Yes. Just yes. do things and be like, let's see how they respond. I'm going to make the bed for them today and I'm going to like make a breakfast in bed. Let's see if they're really like acts of service. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. And then at the end of the week, figure out what was the most impactful. And then I want you to email me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And email me too, would you? Yeah. Nate at growthmarriage.com. I want to hear about it. Awesome. I love this so much. Okay. Last question. Most important. If you had the undivided attention of all the married couples <sighs> in all the world. What is the most important thing you could teach them about communication in marriage? about communication and marriage. Or having difficult conversations, because I know that's your thing. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think starting with, I know you, I like you, and I have your back is gonna be the, the biggest thing. Like, if you can establish that friendship and make sure that you cultivate it in an ongoing manner, you're gonna notice that like 80% of your conflicts just disappear because you're gonna be giving your partner the benefit of the doubt, you're gonna be trusting them more, you're gonna have confidence in that relationship and the fact that, it's, it's so funny the way that we get married and we're like, you marry the person that you love more than anybody in the world that you trust more than anybody else in the world and then like a month into marriage, you get this fear of like, can I trust them? Are they gonna be there for me? Maybe, did they have malicious intentions when they said that thing? They use that tone of voice, are they out to get me? And it's like, all of our love gets turned into fear. And so by focusing on, I know you, I love you, and I have your back, you're, you're getting rid of some of that fear and dread that your partner's not going to be there for you and reinvesting it into creating that love. Um, that would be the first thing I would say. And then the second thing I would say is that if you are caught in a conflict-heavy relationship and you're feeling frustrated and stuck, like you're just arguing nonstop, or, or even wor worse in some cases, you try and have a hard conversation and your partner just shuts you out that's another form of arguing and you just feel so lonely in your relationship um, the next piece of advice I would have is that you have the power to change your relationship even if your partner doesn't want to participate in that change and the great thing about uh, a marriage is that it requires there's two people involved and it takes two people to create a certain system and if the system that you have created isn't working just by changing your inputs, it changes the dynamic of the system and your partner is forced to show up differently. And so I would invite you to invest in learning what you can do differently to put your partner in a position where they have to show up differently to engage with you. And then by changing those inputs, you can get different results. So don't feel like all is lost if you're feeling stuck or lonely or like you can't get out of this conflict cycle because you absolutely can. I see it happen all the time. Oh my gosh, I love that so much. And I have to say that that system talk was so psycho babbly, but I love it. Did it make sense? It makes perfect sense. Thank you so much, Nate Bagley. This has been awesome. I Oh, thank you. When I talk to you, I'm like, yes, I've got so much more stuff in my tool belt. <laughs> the feeling is mutual. I love talking to you and I love what you're doing for the world. You give the best actionable tools. I honestly feel like Thanks. after every conversation with you, I've got more tools in my tool belt. 
So well, we should do this more often then. Let's do it. To learn more ways to deepen your intimacy and strengthen your relationship, make sure you watch this video next.